morning, Father, and we just, as we open your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. We pray that you would encourage us, Lord. We pray that uh, you, would, you would bless us, Lord. We pray that we would end up uh, knowing more about you and wanting to walk closer with you, Father. And we ask all these things through your son, Jesus. Amen. So the last time I taught was on a, on a Sunday. It was back at the 1st of August. I don't know if you remember. I'm looking to see. Okay, we have communion ready. It was, um, I'm sure all you guys remember what the study was about. So we'll just continue on from there. So open your Bibles there. <laughs> but for those of you who were lucky and weren't here that Sunday, or maybe you don't happen to remember the last study, I'll give a short recap. The study is going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And uh, the short recap is, we're speaking of King David, David who God had brought from a, from a lowly shepherd boy. He anointed him to be the uh, next king of Israel, and it made him a hero with uh, Goliath and, and um, his victories in war, and then he made him a fugitive, running from King Saul. But now, God has made him king. In fact, David had just become king of all Israel. And one of the first things David did as king of Israel was to take Jerusalem and make it his capital city. And to keep God in the picture, David brought the ark into Jerusalem. So his, and that's what the last that he was about, in case you don't remember. But so to historically or chronologically set up today's lesson, David is ruler over all Israel. He has defeated the Philistines twice when they tried to invade. As he just became king, and the nation's growing united, they're growing strong. And by bringing the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem, David has made God the center of his kingdom. See, David's at a really good place with the Lord right now. But there's one thing more David would like to do, and that's where we'll start our, Sunday, our study at this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Well, you go and do this all in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now at this time, David's living in a beautiful home. We know that 2 Samuel 5, 9-11 through 11 says, And when David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David, and David built all around from the Milo and inward, so David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Then Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So I have a, a, a photo of the city of David, and I don't know how to turn this on, so I don't have a pointer. But at the very top of the photo up there, you see the temple. Well, at this time, the temple's not there. That's just the hill. That's a threshing floor. And so David lives at the, the house right next to the temple, and that's his, the house that he's built. And he's living up at the northern end of the city of David, and he thinks that he needs to build a house for God. See, David's home was built by the best carpenters and masons around, the same ones that God used to build the temple. We know that Hiram sent him wood from famous cedar trees of Lebanon, and it was primarily built of cedar, but at those time, houses were built out of stones. And you couldn't have really big rooms because they wouldn't support a, a huge roof, but not so with, with wood, with cedar wood. David, his house had beams, he had huge wood, rooms. So it was built primarily out of cedar, and his house is a nice, beautiful home, but not only that, it said in verse 1, the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. See, God has given David peace. There's no enemies at the gate. There's no one crashing the border. And David hasn't had peace in his life since he was a boy. And David uses his time wisely. He has the ark brought to Jerusalem, and the ark is still on his mind. Think about it. He's control of the place that God has chosen to meet his people. And he thinks, here I am in this beautiful house that God has given me. Bless me beyond measure, but where's the ark? See, where's the mercy seat, the place where God meets the people? It's in a tent. It's in behind curtains. And that bothers David. So he tells Nathan, his prophet. In fact, this is the first time in the Bible you see the prophet Nathan mentioned. The Bible doesn't say much about him. But he tells him, I want to build a temple, a house, an ark for God, and I want to build something worthy, a place for the ark to put the ark of God in. Nathan thinks that's a great idea, and he tells him, go for it. See, and David's still in a good place. You know, most people, when they come into a period of rest and peace, and they're blessed, they think, well, what can I do? Where can I go? I want to do something. I want to have some fun. Where can I go on vacation? But the first thing David does is to have the ark move to Jerusalem. His mind is on the Lord. 
And the next thing he does is try to build a house for it. See, David's putting God first in his life, and I'm sure you all see the spiritual application to us. God has blessed us beyond measure. He's blessed all of us, and we all have a control of the place where God meets us, our heart. And it's up to us whether or not we spend our free time on our own desires, or like David does here, seeking a way to draw closer to the Lord. And Nathan tells David, do all that's in his heart. He says, for the Lord is with you. Build the temple. Make a dwelling place for the ark. But you know what? You need to be careful doing what your heart tells you to do. We have sayings, if you really feel good in your heart, if you you feel good about it in your heart, just go ahead and do it, you know. But that's not good advice. In fact, never give someone that advice. God says in Jeremiah 7, 19, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And yet we see Nathan telling David, go do all that's in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Really? Is it all right with God for David to build the temple? The answer is no, it's not all right with God for David to build the temple. He does have an issue with it. So does that make Nathan a false prophet? The Bible states that if a prophet prophesies one thing that is wrong and that one thing doesn't come to pass, then he's a false prophet. But it doesn't make him a pro- false prophet because Nathan doesn't tell David, thus saith the Lord. Or he doesn't say the word of the Lord came to me. We don't see Nathan seeking God before he answers David. He just tells him what's obvious to him. Sure, the Lord would want you to build a house for him. But you know, be careful giving advice, guys. Even if it seems like it's really good advice to someone, never forget to include God in the picture. You know, tell him, let's pray about it. Pray about it. See what the Lord has for you. See where he leads and directs and guides you. Now, it's different if someone comes up and asks you about an area of sin that's in the Bible. Should I do this? You can say, no, the God's already spoken. His word says, don't do that. So we know that. But Nathan, he does, he can kind of mess us up here, but God gets his attention fast. In verse 4, he says, but it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? See, Nathan's a prophet of God, and now we see God speaking to him. The very first thing he tells Nathan to do is to remind David Now, like this, he says, tell him that he's my servant, that he's not upset with him. Go and tell my servant David. No, I like that. God God acknowledges that David has a servant's heart. And first he's to ask David, would you build a house for me to dwell in? It seems like God is telling David, you know, it's good that you want to build a house for me, David, but I didn't ask you to. Then God tells Nathan to tell David, from the time I delivered you from Egypt until now, have I ever asked anyone? Have I ever asked any of the leaders that I commanded to shepherd my people? Any tribal leaders, have I asked Moses or Joshua or Gideon or Samson or Samuel or Saul or even you, David? Have I asked any of them to build me a house? Or have I ever asked, why haven't you built me a house? God's saying the obvious. If I want a house, I'll let you know. You know, Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. God doesn't need a place to build a place for him to live. You know, the important thing isn't that where the Lord, isn't what the Lord dwells in on this earth because he's everywhere. But the important thing is whom the Lord dwells in. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. For God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 8 says, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from a sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I've made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. See, and David knows all that. He knows that everything he has is the result of God's blessings in his life. So you might wonder, well, why is God telling David that he took him from being a lowly shepherd and made him to not just a king of my people, but one of the great leaders of all time? And it it could be that he wants to remind David that he's the source of his blessings. Or it could be that God wants to remind David that he's the one who calls the shots. But it seems like God here is setting up David to let him know that he isn't through blessing him yet. Because God then tells David through Nathan something that has nothing to do with the Ark of the Covenant. He says in verse 10, he says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, 
and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. So through Nathan, God tells David, I have more in store for you. He says that he's going to plant Israel, provide a place for the nation, that it's going to be a permanent location. There's going to be no more moving. That they'll no longer be oppressed by their enemies and that they'll have rest from their enemies and he's going to make a house for David. Now at first this has to sound strange to David. He knows that God has already provided a place for Israel. After all, he used Moses to lead his people to the promised land. So David has to be thinking, what do you mean you're going to plant Israel, provide a place for the nation and they're going to move no more? He's probably thinking, you've already done that. And it's also confusing to us when we read it, for us to understand, because we know that the location that God provided for his people through Moses has not been a permanent location for them. We know that they're going to be carted off to Babylon, that they're going to be dispersed throughout the world by the Romans, and then they're going to be without a homeland for 2,000 years. So David also had to wonder when God told him that they would no longer be oppressed by their enemies and that they would have peace, peace, he's wondering, he may have thought that the peace, the rest from his enemies, that that's what God had already given him back in verse 1, which was the beginning of this promise. But having read the word of God, we know better, because after all, a short time later, David has no peace at all in his life. And as far as his people having peace, the Jews, a few centuries later, they were again conquered and carted off to Babylon. They were again conquered and suffered at the hands of the Romans. They were scattered throughout the world, and throughout the following centuries, they've been persecuted by the Russians, the Germans, the Poles, the Islamic nations, just about every other nation on the face of the earth. See, they haven't had much peace as a nation, or they haven't had a permanent homeland. And then God tells David, he will make you a house. Hasn't God already made him a house? Remember Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent him the house of Cedar, sent his workmen and built him a house? But the question is, What is God talking about here when he tells David all these things? We know God doesn't lie. David knows God doesn't lie. And since these things have not yet come about, we know that he's talking about future events, about prophecy. And then God begins to clarify things a little bit as Nathan continues to prophesy. In verse 12, he says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish this kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So let's go over all this. What God is promising David is a little more clear here. We need to remember many times when God gives a prophecy, it has more than one application. The same prophecy may apply to a near future event, and it may also apply to an event in ages to come. And here, when he says, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, well, we know that he's referring to Solomon, David's son. And what does God promise David he will do for Solomon? He says, I will establish his kingdom. It's interesting, as you get toward the end of 2 Samuel, you see David's sons, Absalom, Adonijah, They have these devious plans to to become king themselves, and they come from David's lineage. They're his sons. In fact, they're even next in line for the throne. And according to the understanding of man, they should be the next king. But yet God thwarts their plans, and he puts Solomon, someone who hasn't said a word about being king, on the throne. So we see God establishing Solomon. But what else did God promise David? He said, he shall build a house for my name. And Solomon does that. God used Solomon to build a temple, a house for the name of God. But note that God has Solomon build a house for his name. God doesn't say he's going to build a house for me. God doesn't reside in a house. Our God is everywhere. Nathan also tells David, If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. See, when Saul committed iniquity against the Lord, what did God do? He took the throne from him. And he gave it to a man after his own heart, David. And here God tells David that even if Solomon commits iniquity against him, and he does, he may suffer the chastening of the Lord, but God will not remove the throne from Solomon's lineage like he did from Saul. But as was mentioned earlier, many prophecies that come from the prophets of God, including this one, have a double meaning. While this prophecy is referring to Solomon, David's son, it's also referring to the Messiah, 
who is also called the son of David. He says, when he says, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, that is Solomon, but it also refers to Christ. He says, I will establish his kingdom, that is Solomon, but he's also referring to Christ. When he says, he shall build a house for my name, that's also both to Solomon and Christ. But then God goes on to tell David, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Does that apply to Solomon? No. Solomon's royal lineage stops at Babylon. That applies only to Jesus Christ, the eternal king. And he continues to tell David, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Now, at first glance, you see Jesus here, God the Father and Jesus the Son. However, if you have one of the Bibles that, that capitalize the word of God or he or, or, or son, or if it's talking about God or Jesus Christ, it's capitalized. Note that the word son is in lowercase. And if that's not speaking about the Messiah, I will be his father and he shall be my son, then who's it referring to? See, and the amazing thing is it seems to be referring to us, to be pointing to our future relationship with God. And we see Christ speaking of this kind of relationship in Revelation 21.7. He says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But Nathan continues and says, If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. And as far as we know, Solomon was never chastised with the rod of men. So could this also apply to Jesus? Well, first of all, you have to ask, did Jesus ever commit iniquity? No, but he did take the iniquity of all mankind upon himself. He became sin for us. And he was chastened with the rod of men and with the blows of men. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy when he suffered at the hands of the Romans just before he was crucified. And we know that Nathan is definitely talking about the Messiah when he finishes his prophecies in verse 16. He says, and your house and your kingdom shall be established there forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. We know he's talking about Jesus Christ. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. But remember back in verse 11 when Nathan tells David, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house? This is what he's referring to, not a physical house, but an eternal house. He says, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So David starts to understand now, and through the Messiah, that God fulfills his promise to David, and, and Jesus, whose lineage is traced back to David, it's called the son of David, his kingdom and his throne, the house of David, shall be established forever. See, Jeremiah gave the same prophecy about 300 years later. He said in Jeremiah 33, 14, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. And we know he's speaking about Jesus Christ. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will be dwell safely. And this is in the name of which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So Nathan concludes his prophecy to David and David shall shocked. And I love his response to the promises God has given him. After hearing God's promises, he wants to be as close as possible to God. So he goes and he sits before the ark, before the mercy seat. Verse 18 says, Then King David went in and he sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. For you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? See, David, when he realizes the promises of God, and the first thing he does is he goes and sits before the Lord, and he says, Who am I, Lord God? What is my house that you brought me this for? David's astonished that even though he's just a servant, God would lift him up as though he were someone of importance. He says, is this the manner of man, O Lord God? See, David's telling God that this is not the way of man. Man would look for someone important or some great person to be granted with this kind of recognition. But God takes an insignificant shepherd boy and pours out his blessing upon him. And king or no king, David realizes just how small, how inadequate he is before God. David wrote in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, he said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. And we might wonder, well, why would God consider David for this? I mean, after all, God knew what David was going to do in his life. God knew what David had done in his life. This is a man who lived with the Philistines for 16 months. We don't hear him trying to 
contact God at all during those 16 months. This is a man who stood on his rooftop, looked over and sees a beautiful woman bathing and follows the lust of his heart and has, commits adultery with her. And to hide his sin, this is the same man that takes her husband Uriah and has him killed. See, this is not a, a, a godly man in the sense of what he does all the time. But it's important for us to understand that God's blessing are never because of what we have done for the Lord. They are always because of what he has done for us, because of his mercy and his grace. And if we apply this to ourselves, guys, like David, God has blessed us beyond measure. God has given us the control to determine where we're going to place God in our lives. Are we going to set him up on the throne room of our heart, build a place for him to stay in our lives? Or are we going to keep him in a tent somewhere? God has also promised us an eternal home, a place of rest, a place to be in his presence. And God has told us he would be our father and we would be his children. But even more than that, Christ considers us his bride. Paul, speaking to the church in, at Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, he says, For I am jealous for you, with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And hopefully, like David, guys, that causes us to draw close to God when we recognize his promises. You know, when I think about my transgressions, when I think about my Bathsheba's, my Uriah's, yeah, my sins may have been different than David's, but they're still sins. They still lead to eternal death. And when I think what God has done for me, like David, I can do nothing but think, who am I, O Lord God? Who am I that you would die on a cross, that you would take my sins upon yourself and pay the price for my sins that I might Receive your amazing eternal promises. See, I realize that it's not because of anything I've done to deserve eternal life. It's quite the opposite. It's because of what God has done for me, for you, for all. It's because of his mercy and his grace. The only thing I've ever done to gain eternal life is to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're watching this online, if you want the promises that God has promised, ask them to forgive you your sins. Ask them to come into your heart. Accept them as your Lord and Savior. We'll give you an opportunity to do that if you're here. But David continues in his response in verse 20. He says, Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, you know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. See, David's on cloud nine. When God tells you that you're not only to become a great leader of his people, but he's going to make you a great world leader, plus he's going to use your son to build him a house, plus he's going to continue your lineage as kings, plus he's going to make your great, 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 however many great grandson, the Messiah, he's going to make God himself come from you to establish an eternal kingdom. And God tells you that, you're going to be tripping. That's what David's doing. He said, now what more can David say to you? But the only thing David says is, first of all, he says, God, I know I'm just a servant. And then he says, God, you promised to me this to me. I heard it from you with my own ears, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And he tells God, this is your idea. It's not mine that this was promised to me. He said, for your word's sake and according to your own heart. And David's thinking, what a great, amazing, and mighty God. And in verse 23, he says, and who is like your people, like Israel? The one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people. To make for himself a name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever and you, Lord, have become their God. See, like any great leader, he's including the people in his blessing. He reminds God right away that all these people are his people. He says, who's like your people? Then he reminds God that he's the one who made them a great nation. He's the one who personally redeemed them by his power, his great and awesome deeds. He's the one who delivered them from Egypt and from all other nations. And then he again tells God that these are his people, the people who he has given eternal promises, and he's their God. You have made your people Israel, your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And then David says in verse 25, he says, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you said. It's like he's telling God, I know I'm just a servant, but you said it, so you have to do it. 
You know, it's like he's worried that God might change his mind. He says, establish it forever and do as you've said. In verse 26, he says, So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. See, David again lets God know that he realizes he is but a servant. Praising God, he says, let your name be magnified forever. He praises God. He tells God that he's the God over Israel. He asks God to do as he said to establish his house before him. He says, God, help my sons, my grandsons, serve you, build their dynasties around you. He says, since you fully revealed to me what you meant by saying, I will build you a house, I am praying thanks to you from the bottom of my heart. He says, I found it in, he found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. See, David's mind is blown. But I want you, if you can this morning, imagine having God give you everything that you could ever desire. And then telling you that the king for all eternity will be your great, 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 great grandson. Imagine that for a little bit. And David ends his prayer by saying in verse 28, And now, O Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. See, David closes his prayer by telling God that he believes his promises. And he again tells God he is a servant. That's the eighth time David says that in the last 12 verses. He God, I'm your servant. But he asked God to bless his house and his servant forever. My question to you is, how would you respond if God made those promises to you instead of David? You know, when you teach the word of God, if you do it correctly, there are two things that you always bring out. One is, where is Jesus Christ in the lesson? See, because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ, and everything in the New Testament reveals Jesus Christ. And the second thing is, how does that apply to us, to our walk with the Lord? As for the first point, it's pretty obvious where Jesus Christ is in the lesson. It's a lesson that prophesies the coming of the Messiah. But How does it apply to us? I just asked, how would you respond to God if he made these promises to you instead of David? Well, let me assure you this morning that God has personally promised you much more than all this. See, God promised David for comparison, that his great, 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 however many great grandson would be the Messiah, the one who would rule and reign for eternity. That's quite a promise. That's an amazing promise. But you know what God has promised you? God has promised us that we would actually rule and reign with his great, great, great grandson. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.11, 12 says, This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. See, we get to experience firsthand. Who has the greater promise? Also, while God told David concerning his son Solomon, he said, I will be his father and he shall be my son. God tells us that not only will we be his son, but we will inherit all things. Revelation 21.7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Romans 8, 16, and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Well, again, I ask you, who has the greater promise? Also, God promises David that there will come a time when his people Israel will be planted. They will have a place to stay. It's called the millennium. Christ will come down and he will live on this earth in the city of Jerusalem. And his people, the Jews, get to live with Christ for 2,000 years. And during that time, they will have peace from their enemies. And that's a great promise. But God tells us in Revelation 21.4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Psalm 1611, written by David, says, You show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures are forevermore. I don't think we can imagine what fullness of joy means, to be in the presence of God, to have so much joy that you couldn't have anymore, eternally, in the presence of God. Not only that, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Again, who has the greater promise? I could go on and on, but you guys get the gist of it. 
See, the promises that God gives us through his word have just as much weight as God sending a prophet to speak to David. Or God personally speaking to Moses. They are just as true. We need to realize what God has done for us and what the end result will be if we keep our eyes on the Lord, guys. See, this morning we're going to take communion. It's something that God has told us to do in order to keep God in the center of our life. So if I could have Benny, Vernon, Ryan, Troy, you all here? One, two, three. When a four. If I could have you come up and pass out the sacraments. But while they come up, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're here, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Or if there's something in your life that you do want us to pray for, if there's anything you need to get rid of, ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forgive it. Don't take communion if you have something you want to hold on to. Don't take communion if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. God says you're drinking damnation to yourself. No one will think any less of you. So, you guys, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a great and mighty God, Lord. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for your promises, Father. We thank you for your encouragement, Lord. We, we, everything we keep our eyes upon this life that we know, Lord, and compared to eternity, it's not even a snap of the fingers, Father. Help us to realize eternity, Father. Help us to realize the blessings you've given us, Father, if we've accepted you as our Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here this morning that need forgiveness of sins and have the Lord Jesus Christ dwell in your heart, God says he's faithful and just to forgive all sin. If you ask him, he says whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have ever life, if you ask him. If you want the promises of God to apply to you, and if you want eternal life instead of eternal damnation, see, Jesus always gives you a choice. If you want to ask him to your heart this morning to forgive of your sin, to accept him as your Lord and Savior, to put him in the center of your life, just look up this morning. If there's anyone here. If you're watching online, I encourage you, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if there's anyone here that wants prayer, Guys, if there's, if there's any sin you're dealing with or if you need a healing, physical or emotional or encouragement or strength or a stronger walk or joy or just you need a, a, a just direction and guidance, whatever you need in your life, if you want us to pray for you this morning, look up and we'll all pray together. Thank you there. Thank you. Thank you there. Back there. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you, for Lord, for all that you've done for us, Father. And I pray that you would encourage us, Lord, to put you in the center of our life, Father. To make you, Lord, uh, our goal, Father. To uh, give you the, the, the first fruits of our lives, Father. I just thank you for all that you do. And I pray for everyone here, Lord, that you would meet them where they're at, Father. I pray that you would heal the sick, Lord. I pray that you would touch those who, who just need to be encouraged, Lord. I pray that you would touch those who may be hurting us spiritually, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless us, Lord. That these that need to answer to prayer, Father, or just need direction and guidance, Lord. You know our needs, Father. We bring them before you this morning. We ask that you would bless and just meet us where we're at, Father. And I ask it through your son, Jesus. Amen. So this morning, while there are if we want to take this time, let's take time just to reflect just to spend some time with the Lord and just prepare your heart to take the sacrament.